Put your hands together. Give God a praise offering. They're saying the board is not, just put it, um, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's here for being here. Uh, give yourselves a hand. This is a significant increase from our normal Thursday night crowds. So at least during the season of Lent, we're making a sacrifice of time to invest in our spirit life because when we uh, make any advances in our spirit life, that is the center from which we are able to advance the other needful areas of our lives. As we seek first the kingdom of God and then all these things, these other things shall be added on to us. This is the war room. And uh, we welcome all of you. I hope that all of you have signed in. If you have not, then you should go out and sign in now. Uh, I want to start uh, right in as we are good stewards of uh, time. Um, I realize many of you are under stress because scandal comes on again tonight. And I don't want to engage in the scandal of making you late uh, for such a serious, serious appointment. Um, serious or not, I do understand the things that are on the minds of the people of God. My daughter did remind me that it does start. And nobody else, she'll be out by 8.40. No, we will all be out by 8.30. Um, so, um, for tonight, if everyone turns to your course outline, if you can put that up on the screen for me. from now for the next um, 45 minutes till offering. And I want our music people to stay around because we will need you to bring our song of preparation uh, during the offering time and our e exhortation for victorious living will be at 7.50 and then we will have uh, prayer 8.20 and we'll be out the door at 8.30. But for the next 25 minutes, we will have our war room lesson uh, for the week. Now, if you can pull up, uh, our media service folks, the uh, course description. Is everyone looking at that? You have that in front of you? Okay, so you can look at your hard copy till it comes up on the screen. The war room, let me get my glasses out, let me stop fronting. Oh God, thank God, I once was blind and now I see. The War Room is a Lent Bible study that is designed to teach Christians how to utilize prayer as an effective weapon for personal transformation and for victorious change. Somebody say change. Change, change in life in the critical life circumstances. We're not talking about giving up chocolate or something silly like that. We're not talking about being silly with the things of God, but going after the real strongholds in our lives. The things that are defining the quality of our lives upwardly or downwardly. So we need victory in areas in our lives where we have experienced defeat and not victory. Where we have been less than empowered and our lives have, have suffered for the sake of it. The topics we will cover in this class will be connecting prayer to the critical needful areas of our lives. Utilizing prayer to develop a spirit of gratitude. A spirit of gratitude. There's something very wrong when Christians have a complaining spirit, to be an ingrate, as I used to hear the old folks say. Just no matter how much they get, they just ain't sad, they're just ungrateful. And in utilizing prayer to resolve anger and rage, saved people still get mad as hell. Um, and then utilizing prayer to resolve guilt and shame. Saved people still got stuff that's leaning on their conscience and don't allow them to have peace. So we want to utilize prayer to actually unstop the drain in needful areas of our lives. Now, what you needed for tonight, as was, a, as was articulated to you on Sunday and last Thursday, is you need your Bible. Everybody got their Bible? Yeah. Let me see your Bible. Hold your Bible up. No soldier should go to battle without their weapon. All right. All right. 
Uh, everyone should have a journal. Do you have your journal? All right, how many of you have, have your journal? How many of you don't have it with you but do have a journal? I personally am using an electronic journal. I'm journaling on my computer uh, because that works best for me. All right, and uh, how many of you have a war room, have identified a physical space for your daily prayer and meditation? All right, that's good. Uh, and uh, how many of you have identified at least one, preferably two, trusted prayer study partners? That's good. How many of you have not yet? How many, those of you who have not, stand up. I'm not trying to embarrass you, I'm doing this strategically. You may want to select from those other persons who are standing, somebody that you may feel comfortable with. Uh, the issue here is trusted because the kind of things that I want us to get into um, is not the kind of thing you would tell somebody you don't trust. So if you don't trust them, they're not the person for you because then you will limit the conversation to stuff that doesn't matter, which means you're wasting your time. All right. I want you to get I want you to, to aim for that stuff that if they told it, you might kill them. <laughs> but I want you to tell it people who would tell it to people who would die rather than break your confidence. That's how deep I want us to go. As long as how low can you go? That's how that's how deep I want us to go. You may be seated. All right. Now, in terms of your war room, a physical space for your daily prayer and meditation, um, we um, do want you to. I do want you to write out what your prayer desires are and fears and all those kinds of things. Now, some of you, because we live in houses where multiple people are in them, and discretion is the issue, and people, even people love you, do get nosy. All right. And let me say this to people. If it wasn't mailed to you, it's none of your business. The worst thing you can ever do, open somebody's mails, read somebody's diary. I don't care if you're husbands and wives. You have no right to go through somebody's stuff. I've been married 26 years. My wife would say, go in my purse and get my keys. I will get her purse and hand it to her. Because I was taught as a kid, you don't go in no woman's purse. I've been married 26 years. I don't go in my wife's purse for nothing. Ain't nothing in her purse my business. She could have a gun that she got to shoot me, and I won't know it. I just pray that when she pulled it out, I'm faster than her. <laughs> All right? So because of that, I'm using the electronic journal because I'm posting my stuff where can't nobody get at it. All right? So you do what you need to do because sometimes people who love you are still nosy. All right? Look at your neighbor and say, my business ain't your business. If you have a war room, I hope you can lock it so that only you can go in there. The worst thing you can ever do is violate people's confidence. All right? So do not take the things of God and, and, and destroy it with the devil's curiosity. Your curiosity, ain't, 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 nobody cares about your curiosity. It's just a sinful impulse. Respect boundaries. All right? Um, all right. That said... Uh, this week, we were, we're going to start right in. We were looking at petition and thanksgiving. I need somebody to stand. Uh, do we have another mic? Do we have a second mic set up? While I'm at it, those people in the music worship department, if you're on duty each week, you're supposed to sing till 7.15. We'll have prayer at 7.15 to 7.20, and I'll be up at 7.20. Do not stop at 7.10 or 11. You're going to 7.15, because I will pull you back up here. Amen. Um, I'll just read it since we, uh, in weeks prior, can I have a couple of separate mics set up for audience uh, participation? Turn with me to Philippians 4. 6 and 7. Can we set up a mic right there in the center? Put a mic stand there, a mic right there in the center. Somebody with a big voice who's there, come and read it. Who's got it open? Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and 
petition with thanksgiving present your request present to god. i'm sorry present your request to god and the peace of god which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in christ jesus okay all right so keep the scripture up there to get to peace we got to pray prayer is the pathway to peace in this troubled world we need peace we need peace about the stuff that's going on we need peace within ourselves jesus is the prince of peace so peace is the byproduct of a good strong prayer life now go to verse six. Oh, you have it up there do not be anxious about anything and anybody anxious and the scripture never instructs us to do stuff that we already got under control so the presumptive principle here is that Folk up in here who know Jesus have anxiety. Is it fair to say that there's a, a, a relative high level of anxiety in the lives we live? If nothing else, just road rage. So it's, it's telling us push back on the anxiety instead of being overcome with anxiety and everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God. So he's teaching us that in there has to be a balance in in prayer there has to be a balance of petition which is asking and requesting and thanksgiving which is giving god credit for what he's already done and it's important that we balance petition with thanksgiving because if you exclude the thanksgiving and you get fixated on the petition in terms of what you need god to do for you then you're going you're constantly looking at life from the deficit and you will literally pray your way into depression because even though you're talking to God about what you need God to fix, the subject matter is always what's broken. And if the only thing you're ever talking about is what's not going well, then you get the feeling that nothing's going well. And you can literally pray yourself sad. That's why it says with Thanksgiving because it's a teeter-totter. Thanksgiving balances the scale. So while you and God are fixing things, you, you keep in mind that there's still always more things going right than things going wrong. And that'll psychologically keep your head above water and keep you in the game till you can win it. All right. So now your assignment was um, to think of one thing, one big thing. BHAG, big, hairy, aggressive goal. One big thing, one defining thing, one meaningful thing in your life where you are experiencing defeat that you know you need to change, that you need to have victory in that thing. And that you needed to identify it and write it down. There is power in putting it down. Oh, I don't mean somebody saying get along with people better. That's so broad that how do you measure if you're making progress? Huh? I need to be more positive in my attitude. That's so broad. Rashan Bush said there's safety and ambiguity. Sometimes we talk in ambiguous terms so that we can't be pinned down. All right? So what is it specifically? I have a drinking problem. That's something you know you need to get under control. That'll ruin your health, your finances, your relationships, your work record, everything. All right? Um, I have a drug problem. I have a gambling problem. I haven't spoken to my sister in 20 years, and she lives next door. Right. I got an adult child with a bunch of kids living in my house, and I want to get rid of them by any means necessary, and I can't get them to go. They driving me crazy, and I can't stand to go home to my own house, and I need them out, Lord. That's something specific. That's something specific. I need to go back to school and get my master's, but I'm afraid to go. Kids are gone. I said when the kids go, now the kids are gone, and I still haven't done it. Ain't nobody holding me back but me. All right? I need you to identify. How many of you in here identified one big thing? Let me see the hands. Good. Did you write it down? 
If you have not written it down, I want you to write it down right now. You got to put it out. You got to externalize it. Write it down right now. David said, one thing have I desired of Lord and that I will seek after. You got to write it down. Be specific. Something defining. Something that matters. Don't go after ticky-tack stuff. Stop playing with the spiritual things. There are strongholds in our lives, and we need to go after them. I compulsively spend and my credit is shot because I can't say no to me when I, the temptation of buying something. That's very real to a lot of people. Major reason why a lot of people in church who know they're supposed to tithe don't tithe is because their credit and their finances is so jacked up because they have no discipline and control when it comes to the management of money. They're no different than the crackhead is in relationship to drugs, can't help themselves. It's really a lack of discipline. It's just different areas of our lives where we fall apart. So those of you who identified your one thing, now, then you were supposed to identify what are your fears related to that thing. How many of you did that? Did you find it difficult to do that? What are your fears related to that? All right. Depending on the nature of what it was, because there is such thing as inappropriate disclosure. You know, if you're in an AA group where everybody's drinking and the, the, the spirit of anonymity is the law of the group, people can tell each other almost anything. But once you go outside that group, you can't be telling anything to everybody. Confession is good for the soul, but it's terrible for the reputation. Anybody want to give me a, an example, a couple examples of the fears wrapped around the thing that God needs to change that's appropriate for disclosure in a group like this? Some of the fears, ma'am. Stand up and blurt it out. You can hear yourself, but we can't hear you all, all over the room. Okay, she said rejection. I'll repeat what they say. Okay. She said rejection. Anybody else? Name some of the fears. Owen? Stand up, stand up. You fear that you'll overthink it. Yep. Okay. Somebody else. Linda, stand up. When you guys start, stand up so you can, through your voice will project. Ah. Is that the thing that you praying on God? Okay. So your fear is that if you try to forgive, you won't be. So the fear really is failure. That you won't let it go. Mm. Okay. Yeah. That's real. Yeah, when you hear David say, I hate them with a perfect hatred, when that thing gets so deep, sometimes you wonder if you have the capacity to let certain things go. At least you know you're dealing with the right thing. Anybody else? Give me some of the other examples. Diane? Okay, that's your fear. Your fear is that you'll shift the blame to someone else? Okay. Somebody else, your fear. Fear of change. You know you need the change, but you're afraid of what it is. So you'd rather go with the devil that you know than the devil that you don't know. Or the devil that you know, you'd rather go with the devil you know than the saint you don't know. Somebody else, I saw a hand. Fear of success. Because every blessing comes with new burdens. You know, as long as you're on the bus... You pray you want a car, but when you have a car, you got to wash it and keep it clean. So with every blessing comes new burdens. Your fear is that you won't hear it or you won't know it. Is it maybe that you're afraid that God's going to require something of you that you really don't want to do? So is the thing that you want God to do is to give you that motivation to do it? Okay. Anybody else? Compelling fears. Not being likable. Somebody won't like you, which is back to rejection. To remove all doubt. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. So what's your fear? 
Because that sounds like a goal. Something needs to change. I need to remove doubt. So then what's your, what are you afraid of? You're afraid that you won't be able to walk in faith and trust. Yeah. These are important questions because everybody that God called, the first thing they spoke were their fears. God calls Moses and what does he say? Lord, who am I that I should go into Pharaoh and say to Pharaoh, let your people go. God calls Gideon. He says, Lord, I am the least in my father's household. When you realize the magnitude, your perceptions of what God is calling you to do, and then all of a sudden you come to terms with your own sense of inadequacy. And you start to speak your fear. Who am I? Because when I look at the littleness of my self-perception and the bigness of the challenge of what I feel God is calling me to do, it seems much bigger than me. And, and, and I come to, if you don't feel that, then you're probably not aiming at what God really wants you to do. You're probably aiming at something so insignificant that even if you achieve it, it won't make no difference. Ma'am? end up alone. Ah. Ah. I'm not even going to ask you what your goal is, but that's a real fear. And that's an on I appreciate that kind of honesty. Fear of the process, what might be involved in getting from A to B. Okay? All right. So, last one, Beverly. Fear that we won't sustain it. Yeah, it's like, I want to take some weight off, but fear that I won't be able to keep it off, so then what's the point? Huh? Okay, so you were supposed to list your fears. Then the question was, after we wrote down our fears, honestly, honestly, and I need you to be honest, because the thing about keeping your own notes, ain't nobody looking at it but you. So you ought to at least be able to be honest with yourself. And to look at it honestly, is, and, and in you, before you talk to anybody else, what does what I wrote down say about me? What does it say about me that I have these fears? What does it say about me? And how many of you wrote down, responded to that? Raise your hands up high. How many of you didn't get that far? Raise your hands up high. Okay, you got some homework to do because you got, this is self-talk. You know, in the Bible, you see the prodigal son talking to himself, and he said, there's, there's servants in my father's house who are eating better than I. And, and, and the Bible makes us privy to internal talk. And so this is internal talk. When I look at what I'm afraid of, what does that say about me to me? Then after we do that, then we were supposed to go to our trusted prayer partners, people who die rather than tell the stuff that I would kill them if they told and get some feedback from them. How many of you did that? That's pretty good. Give yourselves a hand. How many of you still need to do that? I'm gonna put you on the honor system that between now and next week you will do that because part of the benefit of this class, the Bible says, um, a wise man giveth unto counsel. So I need you to be sharing this. I have one person who's local and another person who's out of state that I went, that, who's a part of my trusted uh, prayer team. And they gave me some real biting feedback related to my fears. Me and the teaching team, we are all going through this with you, all right? And so when I looked at the thing that I need God to change in my life and then the fears that I had around it and did what I thought this says about me and then shared it some with my trusted prayer partners, one of them said, uh, there's a couple of things that you obviously left out. <laughs> and I almost hung up on one of the people because it offended me. And, uh, and, and, and that's when you have in the level of conversation you need. The people who love you enough and know you well enough to say to you the stuff that you need to hear that will tempt you to get off the phone if you're on the phone or get up and leave. All right? Everybody needs somebody like Nathan to say to you, David, thou art the man. To press you at that point because in the silos of our own mind, we can rationalize, justify, and verificate on anything. But somebody who's outside of your insanity and your madness can press you in ways that you need to be pressed to go to uh, the next level. Now, 
Balancing with that, we were supposed to look at Psalms of Thanksgiving. Now, how many of you did that, read Psalm 107 and Psalm 103? Did you enjoy those? How many of you read those for the first time? How many of you aren't telling the truth right now? <laughs> did you notice that he moved from the general in terms of what God is doing for the people down to the specific of what he's doing for the individual? The thing I like in Psalm 103 and verse 10 and 12, he says that God will not repay us according to our iniquities, but God will uh, turn his face, separate himself from our sins as far as the east is from the west. I don't know about you, but as somebody who's, who's committed more than his fair share of sins along the way in the course of life, that just made me stop right there and say, I just write that down for things I'm thankful for, that God is a forgiver of sin. That made me feel pretty good right there. Now, for all of you people who holier than thou, maybe you just were read right on by that one, but I had to stop and shout on that one right there. All right. How many of you, and I'm going to move on from here because my time is exhausted. How many of you uh, found that when you started writing down your list of things that you should be grateful for despite what you and God are praying about, the big hairy goal that you should be praying about every day, even through the course of this class, how many of you found that in writing it down every time you thought you were done, you thought of something else? Yeah. Found it hard to stop and then the next day you keep adding and you find out that your list of woes is much shorter than your list of blessings. Huh? And I almost make you feel bad about having a list of well, and that's the psychological importance of listing you, the things you ought to be thankful for because your perception of, of how mistreated you are in life may shift. Your perception of being forgotten about by God might shift. Your perception that everybody else is doing better than you might shift. Because if you don't stop and count your blessings, as the old song you say, name them one by one, count your many blessings, see what God has done, you might be looking past a trail of blessings that is like a king's ransom for the sake of one little thorn in the flesh. Not to discount the thorn in the flesh, but that's not the only thing going on in your life. How many of you can say after looking at your list today that you're pretty blessed? Now, here's what I want to do because my time is exhausted. I want somebody to stand because this is for next week. I want you guys to complete what you were supposed to do for this week. Day, each day going forward, I want you to pray about that one thing that you and God know needs to change and those fears and your th list of thanksgiving and keep extending that list of thanksgiving. Keep doing that even as we move on to other lessons. Now, I, moving on to next week's lesson, if you look in your book, this is what needs to be done for next week, and we're going to spend the next two weeks on this. I want you to read Psalm 109, and here I want somebody to come, I'm going to take a few moments, and uh, somebody to come right now and read Psalm 109. Can you put Psalm 109 up there? Psalm 109. I want everybody to read it in their Bible, not even up from the screen. I want you to read it in your Bible. I love this technology. There's something about holding the Bible. Because these are scriptures that I promise you, nobody's ever stood up on Sunday morning and read it for the call to worship. <laughs> Psalm 109. I want you to feel this. Oh God, whom I praise, do not remain silent. For wicked and deceitful men have opened their mouths against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongues. With words of hatred, they surround me. They attack me without cause. In return for my friendship, they accuse me, but I am a man of prayer. They repay me evil for good and hatred for my friendship. Appoint an evil man to oppose him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tired, when he is tried, let him be found guilty. And may his prayers condemn him. May his days be few. May another take his place of leadership. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children be wandering beggars. May they be driven from their ruined homes. May a creditor seize all he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his labor. 
May no one extend kindness to him or take pity on his fatherless children. May his descendants be cut off, their names blotted out from the next generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord. May the sin of his mother never be blotted out. He didn't brought his mama into it. May <laughs> Go ahead on. <laughs> may their sins always remain before the Lord that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. For he never thought of doing a kindness, but hounded to death the poor and the needy and the brokenhearted. He loved to pronounce a curse. May it come on him. He found no pleasure in blessing. May it be far from him. He wore cursing as his garment. It entered into his body like water, into his bones like oil. May it be a cloak wrapped around, about him, like a belt tied forever around him. May this be the Lord's payment to my accusers, to those who speak evil of me. But you, O sovereign Lord, deal well with me for your name's sake. Out of the goodness of your love, deliver me. Stop right there. Now. Look what he wants for himself. Wow. Look what he's praying. He says, Lord, let him die. Let his father's children, don't nobody feed him. Let his mama's sins be brought out in the open and everything you forgave. I want you to go and recover the file. You know, on your computer, you go get the file. Let their whole family line be cut off from the earth. He cursed people, now let them be cursed. Let cursings be like a garment that wrap around him and just choke. This is rage. This person is mad as hell. They are pissed off. They want him dead, 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 dead. This, this is Angela Bassett in What's Love Got to Do With It when she slapped that woman. This is, this is rage. And this is a man of the temple. Being saved does not exempt and protect our hearts from rage when we feel that we have been mistreated or neglected. All right? And rage can darken your personality and come out sideways when you won't even admit it's there. So all them old phony answering machines, uh, bless the Lord, how you doing today? I don't claim anger and that at all. Shut up. All of us are human enough. We get dogged, we get mad. We don't love somebody and then they, and, and they abandon us, neglect us, we mad. When brothers and sisters were treated better than we think we were treated, we get mad. When society treats our group different from other people and they shooting our kids and nobody else's, we get mad. But we gotta work through that and prayer is the opportunity to work through that. And that's why the Holy Spirit put this in the Bible so that we can see articulating and being honest about our rage is the first step toward resolving it. But pretending that since I'm saved, I can't even own it because then that means something's wrong with me. No, it means you're human and you got hurt. And there are preachers who are mad. There are deacons who are mad. There are people who sing like a bird and mad. And it's showing up as cancer and headaches and sleeping disorders. And we got to deal with it. And so the lesson for this coming week um, is for you to identify one person or event toward which you have unresolved rage. They may be dead. It may be the father that molested you or uncle. Write a prayer of rage regarding this person or event. Sometimes in psychology and in, in counseling, they make you write a letter to somebody. Write a prayer of rage regarding this person or event. Anybody gonna read it but you? And you'll read it to your trusted prayer group, but I need you to write it. I need you to take the time to own it and write it and stop saying you ain't mad at nobody because your problem is you're a big fat liar. Read this prayer of rage to a trusted your, to your prayer group and receive their feedback. Let them hear it. Don't edit it. Consider the possible need for professional therapy or pastoral counseling for resolution. Let your trusted, somebody laughed, I ain't playing. Depending on what comes out, discuss this with your trusted group. Then I want you to begin praying day after you write it. That's all I want you to do for the first week. 
Get that done. We'll switch to Matthew 5.44 next week, but I want you to write it down wherever you have unresolved rage. Now, to make up the time, I'm going to go right into the exhortation for the evening, and we'll take our offering on the way going out. But to, to, to get at what I'm going to, I'm going to be a bit self-transparent uh, here so that I can give you permission to be transparent. When I transitioned out of Mount Zion Baptist Church coming in here, and um, when people told me, uh, into first intimated that when I saw that there was trouble going on in the church, we had pews down the aisle and full plates and full pews the whole time I was there, and we tripled the offering and all of that. And then trouble was a brewing, and I was like, where is it coming from? And when I was first told that it was coming, that, that the puppet master was my predecessor, I didn't want to believe it. This is one of the most prestigious African-American men in this part of the country, and I, like every other little black boy, grew up idolizing him. He told me where to go to seminary. And when I found out it was true, it hit the psyche and the psychological template of a young boy who had unresolved anger toward all the men in his life who had disappointed him. Daddy went to prison, stepdaddy went to prison, grandfather was a monster, brother spent the majority of his adult life in prison. Wasn't nobody there. Went to the Baptist Minister's Conference, 25 years of age in Buffalo, looking for mentorship, and they literally ran me out, and I didn't come back for seven years till I came back with other young preachers who had been seminary trained. They resented me because I was the only seminary trained African-American Baptist pastor in the city. At every point in my life, men a generation older who should have been mentors and leaders for me disappointed me. And then one more time it happened. Now I'm at war with the most iconic African-American man in this region for no good reason. And I was mad as hell. And I sat him down and told him to his face stuff that other people around here would not tell Samuel Barry McKinney. And then I went to counseling. Because after three or four times my wife wake up, I wake up in the morning, my wife's sleeping downstairs because I'm fighting in my sleep. And it ain't safe for her in the bedroom. I went to counseling and they made me write a letter he said, don't edit it, just write it. So I wrote it. And he said, I want you to come back next week and I want you to read it to the chair as if he's sitting there. I thought it was silly. I wrote that letter and then went to read it the next week in counseling. And I started reading it. I read the first five lines or so, then I looked up. I didn't even have to read it no more. It is indelibly impressed on my psyche because it came out of me and I knew every word. And it was putrid. It was pussy. It was profane. It was vulgar. And I almost attacked the chair. And with the tears and the sweating, and I got it out so that I could get back towards sanity. I had repressed rage, not anger, rage. And it was pushed by a lifetime of disappointments of that kind. It just was the match that hit the gasoline that was already laying around on the floor. I am not the only one in here with repressed rage. This is an exercise that's intended to help you identify it, own it, and let's begin to dissipate it. All right? Rather than preaching and singing and dancing and everything else on top of it. Amen? So write your prayer, your psalm of rage, and be honest. Don't play with it. Do it right. All right? So George Frost and Alex Booker are coming with our exhortation for the evening. Let's receive them warmly. Appreciate you coming this morning. Coffee will be ready in a couple of minutes. Oh, sounds good. Mm -hmm. Now I ran a sales report from the area. Wrote down a suggested asking price for the house. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you think? Mm-hmm. Now, what did you say your husband did for a living? Um, well, we actually haven't talked about that, but he's a sales rep for Brightwell Pharmaceuticals. Mm-hmm. And uh, where did you say you attended church? Well, we occasionally attend Riverdale Community. Mm-hmm. So you would say you know the Lord? Yes, I would say I know the Lord. You think the Lord is okay with this asking price? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And you have children? 
Miss Clara, my husband Tony and I have been married for 16 years. We have one daughter, her name is Danielle, and she's 10. She enjoys pop music and ice cream and jumping rope. Oh, well, that, that's good to know. Now, you say you attend church occasionally. Is that because your pastor only preaches occasionally? Miss Clara, I really would like to help you sell your house. That's why I'm here. As far as my faith is concerned, I believe in God, just like most people. He's very important to me. Mm -hmm. Well, let me get our coffee. So if I asked you what your prayer life was like, would you say that it was hot or cold? I don't know that I would say it's hot. I mean, we're like most people. We have full schedules. We work. But I, I would consider myself a spiritual person. I'm not hot, but I'm not cold either. Just, you know, somewhere in the middle. Here you go. I've got cream or sugar if you need it. Oh, no, thank you. I like it black. Miss Clara, you like your coffee room temperature? No, baby, mine's hot. Good evening. Whoa. How you guys doing? Good, good. My name is Alex Booker, and I have Reverend Frost here somewhere, and we will be com coming to you talking about spiritual lukewarmness. All right, all right. Turn with me, turn with me if you can, to Revelations chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 14. To the angel of the church of Laod Laodicea, right? These are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Another version says, says I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Somebody say vomit. That means disgusting. That means toxic. That means I don't want it in my system. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth uh, you say i am rich i have acquired a wealth but do not need a thing but you do not realize you are wretched pitiful poor blind and naked i counsel you to buy for me gold refined in fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and self to put on eyes so you can see so we're talking about being spiritually lukewarm so the people of Laodicea, they were, they, it was a rich nation. It was one of the, the seven churches of Asia, that, and it was the, the most wealthy nation. Um, they were built upon banking and financial uh, wealth. They made clothes to all the, the rest of the, the churches in Asia. So because of their financial freedom and their financial abundance, they became spiritually very lazy and lethargic. Um, they felt they didn't need for anything because they had it all. They forgot the source of where that that money came from the source of their so-called quote-unquote success. Um, I feel like that happens a lot in, in countries, in areas where we feel like we have a lot of wealth and a lot of things that we got on our own and we pull ourselves up for our own bootstraps and in reality that, that does not happen and we forget where we, where we actually come from. It creates that spiritual laziness. And that spiritual laziness and not, not having that prayer life and that actual relationship with God causes two things. When you're spiritually lukewarm, God can do nothing to you. What he does, he just kind of lets go. If you guys watched the movie, uh, she was very successful. Her, her husband's successful saleswoman, or salesman, and they were just living their life, and their life just started to tear apart, just break down. The marriage was breaking down. Um, and part of the reason that was happening is because they got away from God. They got away from who they really thought that they were. Um, a spiritually lukewarm person is exactly who she said she was. She would go to church occasionally. She would pray occasionally. She would tithe occasionally, meaning God talked to you occasionally. <laughs> and you got your blessings occasionally because he just lets you go. He can do nothing to you when you don't actually have a relationship with God. He, he just wants you to, you need to plead and beg for God. That's what he wants from you, and that's what he requires of us for him to work to you. And the second thing that happens when you are spiritually lukewarm 
that he can do nothing through you. God does not work with folks who are not 100% bought into who you are. He needs people to be on fire for him in order to work through you. And that's the, the hotter version. And when you're cold, you know, God likes a challenge. He likes people who don't believe in him at all and don't want to deal with him at all. That's cool. I mean, look at Paul. Paul was a perfect example of that as a, as a tax collector. And all, he, didn't, he persecuted the, the Jews. He persecuted them. And now, all of a sudden, he's one of the apostles by the will of God. He's an apostle of Christ. That's a perfect example of becoming cold. But those folks in the middle, he can't work with. He can't work with us. And those folks are actually a detriment to the body of Christ and to the message. That's what it says. I will vomit you. I will spit you out of my mouth because you're toxic to what he wants to accomplish here on earth as it is in heaven. Spiritually lukewarm people, like I said, they go to church sometimes and they claim to be Christians. They claim to be spiritual, but just not religious, which is fine. So when you claim to be spiritual and a believer and a follower of Christ, people see you just as that. But in reality, you don't have that in you. So you say you're a follower, but yet I might see you places you're not supposed to be. And when you get mad, you might use words you're not supposed to use. You might date people you're not supposed to date. You just do things that you're not supposed to do because you're on the fence. You don't have that relationship. Because when you truly have that spiritual relationship, when you truly have that prayer life with God, he really changes you. He makes you a whole new person, a whole new person. You start to look at things differently. You start to, start to talk to people differently. You start to view things differently. And that's what God requires of us is to be really, really invested in him because he will invest in you. But only if you open the door. God is a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on nobody. He's really, he's really not. So you need to open yourself up to him. And that's why being spiritually lukewarm is really, really toxic for you, for your eternal life. I'll break up Reverend Frost to kind of finish it off. Amen. Thank you, Brother Alex. God is good all the time. All right. I'm going to get right into growing out of being spiritually lukewarm. When you go to a restaurant, why do they pour coffee? Why does a, a, a server come around and pour hot coffee into your coffee cup or hot tea? Why do they do that? Because it tastes better? What happens to the coffee? It just sits there for a while. It gets cold or it gets lukewarm. Sometimes it won't get all the way cold, but it'll be lukewarm. But they try to keep it hot so you be satisfied with it. Amen? All right. So uh, God doesn't like believers to be lukewarm either. You don't like lukewarm coffee? God don't like lukewarm believers. Well, he, likes, he loves you all the time. He just don't like you to be lukewarm. <laughs> Amen. So, okay. Um, you are in danger of being lukewarm when you get comfortable in your walk with God, when uh, you, as the word, occasional, or you're uh, lackadaisical. I've never been lackadaisical before. Just don't feel like getting up doing it. Don't feel like going to church. Don't feel like uh, giving. Don't feel like serving. Or think you done did all that and you don't need to do any more. Time for you to retire and rest. Uh, I, you know, Caleb um, uh, and Joshua were two people that said that we're well able to go into the promised land when God said you could. And then there were 10 uh, spies that said, no, we can't. There's giants in the land. Caleb, when he was 85 years old, said, uh, give me another mountain to conquer. So he was all fired up, even 85 years old. Okay. Anyway, the church at Laodicea had become lukewarm, and Jesus was about to find them unsuitable for kingdom building. He was about to take the Holy Spirit out of there. And too often we see, uh, like the, that congregation, we as individuals or even churches, they get lackadaisical, they get comfortable, and sometimes because they have, seem like they have everything. They have money, they have seem political influence, you know, other things going good for them. Uh, and they, they wouldn't say this. See, I've been spiritually lukewarm before. You don't have, anybody else been spiritually lukewarm before? And some of you might still be spiritually lukewarm now. And you, you don't really say that I don't need God, but your, your practice says that you don't need God. The practice says you can do it yourself or the way you think sometimes you're saying that. Anyway, this church had really got uh, really lukewarm and they lost vision. 
They lost their vigor. They just didn't have the excitement anymore that they had from the beginning. A lot of us, when we first get saved, we're fire on fire. We're hot uh, to the boiling point. But, um, and we'll go out and even share our faith to, to other people. Um, but after a while, that kind of, you lose the fire and you lose that intensity. Well, anyway, um, this church, did you see what Jesus said? That they needed to repent and open their hearts uh, to him. So um, if you're lukewarm today, if you find yourself being lukewarm, uh, here is how you can rise above it. Here's how you can grow out of it. And we've got three points here. One is test your spiritual temperature. In Luke 24, 32, it, it says that the people said, did not hearts burn within? If you don't have a burning in your heart for prayer, if you don't have a burning in your heart to hear God's word and, and for serving God, then maybe there's something wrong with your temperature. Maybe your temperature's got a little bit too low in between there somewhere. So test your spiritual temperature. Very important uh, that you test that and see where you stand. It's better that you're either hot or cold, but not in the middle, because there's a tendency when you're in the middle that you just think everything is okay. Okay, so number two, repent and ask God's forgiveness. Hebrews 12 and 6 says that God chastens those he loves. Now, in Revelation, it says the same thing to concerning the, the Laodicean church, that uh, Jesus says that he chastens those he loves. He loves you. And so that's one thing you count on. Even if you're spiritually lukewarm, God loves you. 1 John 1 and 9 says, if you do what? Confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive you and pur purify you of all unrighteousness. So if you're lukewarm, you don't have to stay there. God gives you a chance to get it right. Are you glad God gives you a chance? How many glad God gives you a chance to get things right? When things are wrong, you know they are. And God sometimes, I think God is even patient with us sometimes. Amen? So he gives you a chance to get it right. But I think sometimes we repent to get out of being lukewarm, your prayer has to be kind of hot or fired up with some fervency to it. Uh, I used to think that I, I was a reserved person, and I think I still am to some degree. But I used to think about, wow, in church I was reserved, but I could see, uh, I go to football games, I can get all fired up. And I said, wait, that, something is wrong with that. When they tell the story about Jesus and his victory over the devil, then I ought to be fired up about that because I could hear somebody talk about, man, then the Seahawks did it. Oh, did you see that run that Marshawn did? Lynch did and threw 67 yards. And, and Oh, man, and we get all excited about that. Well, something is wrong with that if I can just be cool and relaxed when you talk about the things of God. There's something wrong with that. Like, that's being too crazy. Maybe, you know, I'm, you know, because I, well, let me see. I don't know if I want to say this or not. Yeah, I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> Sometimes people get caught up in tradition. They get caught up in denominational traditions that we just did this way. We did it all along, and we're supposed to be quiet and church and all that. And that doesn't match up what I see in the Bible. I don't see that. But anyway, uh, sometimes... When you repent and ask God, you need to be serious about it. If somebody was in the water and you're drowning, are you going to say, help, I'm drowning? Come, come get me out of the water, please. I'm going to turn my back. Now, you, you, if you were drowning, and, and you know I could, I could swim a little bit. Just everybody right now, act, act like you would if you're drowning. You want to get my attention. Okay. Now, sometimes you have to cry out to God like that too. Now, God can hear you if you just whisper, God can hear you. God can hear what you're thinking too, amen? <laughs> so, but sometimes you need to do that. Of the 51st Psalm, 
after David messed up, or his, he wasn't no little quiet prayer. He know he needed God. And so you want to get out of your, and grow out of your lukewarmness, you're going to have to get out of by praying out of it. And so try the 51st Psalm. God have mercy on me, a sinner, and renew a steadfast spirit renew in within me. Cleanse me. You got to do, do that kind of stuff. God, cleanse me of luke, being lukewarm and straddling fence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Give me more of your Holy Spirit. And say it like you mean it. Amen? Also, it's just like there, another example, 18th chapter of Matthew, the publican versus the Pharisee. Well, the Pharisee came up bragging. Oh, you know, I pray three times a day and all that kind of stuff. He was smug. He was lukewarm, really. And, uh, but he was a publican. He knew he was a sinner. He said, hey, have mercy on me, a sinner. He knew where he was coming from. His prayer was more intense because he needed God. He came out of a need, and he recognized he had the need. Okay? So, okay. So repent and ask for forgiveness, number two. Number three, totally commit yourself to God. If you want to get out of being spiritually lukewarm, you got to make a total commitment. Romans 12, 1 through, uh, 12 chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Basically, what it says is that you, when it comes to total commitment, it's your body, your mind, your gifts and talents. And your gifts means not just your spiritual gifts that God's giving you, but also your money too, amen? Your love by becoming a fan of God and the Lord Jesus and the people of God. You know, um, again, it gets back to, you know, the pastor says this sometime about why he doesn't want to see people coming with football jerseys and things on in church. And that's a good point because we can be a fan that way, but what about a fan of God? I mean, I think when we come to a gathering for church, I mean, I don't, it's not a big deal if somebody had a football jersey on to me, but I think if you're a fan of God, then come here showing that you're a fan of God. You're excited. I think people need to, the way to get out of being lukewarm, come more being excited. God is going to say something to me today. And see, if you, if you come in with that attitude and receptive, because what did Jesus say to the Laodicean church? He said, I'm standing at the door knocking. All you have to do is just open up. You come in here with your heart open, your mind open, and get rid of all the other stuff that you were thinking about before you walked in the door. Okay, so total commitment. Um, and this is all expressed in how you work with and deal with people. See, being totally committed to God is not just a vertical relationship with God, but it's horizontal too, how you deal with people. And be a fan of, of God, be a fan of, of Jesus. It'd be a fan of working with God's people. Now, that might be a difficult thing. How many of you love working with people? Most of us love working with people. But is it always easy? How many ever find that, had you ever said, I hate working with people? I remember I used to be a community organizer at one time, and then one time I was a, a, a city planner, and we had citizen participation, and we had a lot of it, and I was part of a, a vanguard of planners that said, yes, we need to hear what the people say and not top-down planning for people. But I remember one time we had so much citizen participation that I even said to myself, I hate citizen participation. Because first of all, people don't know what they want anyway. I mean, I was really, I was really angry. I was tired of it. See, so anyway, uh, it takes total commitment. And it takes being committed to God's people just as well. Okay, and this total commitment includes being fervent in spirit or literally means hot to the boiling point of serving God, Romans 12, 11, and 12. It says, be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. That means you got to be excited. It's not a cold thing. It's not a lukewarm thing. It's hot. It's turn up. It's uh, what you might call over-the-top commitment. It's talking about being over-the-top like, over commitment. That's what we want. Amen? All right. Be hot to the boiling point in serving God. And I say that comes if you practice being joyful. Amen? Some about joy that will stir you up out of lukewarmness. 
being joyful in hope, okay, but patient in affliction. Trouble don't last always. Those who wait upon the Lord, they'll renew their strength. Amen? Sometimes we just don't wait long enough. How many been that way before and you wish you had waited on God some more? Amen? I'll raise my hand because I've been there. All right. And then lastly, prayerful. Constantly in prayer. If you want to be fervent, if you want to get out of Luke, being spiritually lukewarm, you got to be a regular prayer person. Amen? God bless you.